It's April 5th. The regular season is wrapping up, but for some teams, the playoffs have already started. One of those teams is the Dallas Mavericks, and tonight, they're going to face off with the Sacramento Kings. It's a close game throughout. A floater from De'Aaron Fox makes it a one possession game with two and a half minutes to go. But back to back threes from Kyrie, then Christian Wood put the nail in the coffin. The Mavericks get the win, putting them in a very interesting situation. They're now tied with the Oklahoma City Thunder for the 10th seed in the last playing spot in the Western Conference. They might be able to squeak into the playoffs, but they're also in quite the pickle. There's only two games left in the regular season for both them and OKC, but OKC is the tiebreaker. Dallas doesn't play the following day, but the Thunder do. They face off with the Utah Jazz, who don't even put up a fight. They're now a game ahead, meaning in order for Dallas to make the play in, they need to win both of their final regular season games, but that alone won't be enough. They also need the Thunder to drop their final game against Memphis, but there's no reason to give up, right? Why not take a shot at making a playoff run? Well, there's a little bit more to this situation. The Mavericks had another team to worry about, the Chicago Bulls a team that sat with the same exact record as the Mavericks, and they would actually be facing off the following day. Now, why would the Mavericks care about the 10th seed in the Eastern Conference? To fully understand this, we need to go back to January 31st of 2019. The Mavericks are on a search for a co-star to put aside their third overall pick, putting together one of the most dominant rookie seasons in recent times. They decide on New York Knicks 7'3 unicorn who wants out Kristaps Porzingis. They give up a package of DeAndre Jordan, Wesley Matthews, Dennis Smith, a 2021 first, which ends up becoming Keon Johnson. All those assets have no impact on the Mavericks this past season. But there was one more addition to that deal, a 2023 first with a top 10 protection. Rarely do we see a draft pick protection come down to the wire or have any major impact on a team's end of the season decisions, but that's exactly what we saw this year. The Chicago Bulls and Mavericks were not only just on the bubble of the last playing spot in their conference, they were neck and neck for the 10th spot in the lottery. So this puts the Mavericks in a position where if they make a push for the play-in, they could win out and still not even make it, but in the process, likely cost themselves their first round selection, especially with them having to get one of those wins over Chicago. The right decision is clearly to tank these games with their title chances looking close to non-existent even if they made it out of the play-in. But the right decision can be hard to make when you're coming off a blockbuster all-in trade just a couple months prior at the deadline. This was a team that was in the Western Conference Finals the year prior, but after losing Brunson to New York in free agency, a trip back seemed out of the cards. So they decided to jump on the Kyrie trade request, sending Spencer Dinwiddie, Dorian Finney-Smith, an unprotected 2029 first and two second rounders. At first glance, it might not seem like much for one of the best point guards in the league, but this was a lot, especially for the Mavericks. This was two starters, one of which is their best defender and an unprotected pick for Kyrie with just two months left on his contract. Going into this game with Chicago, they not only face a situation where a win likely results in them losing their first round selection, but they also head to an offseason where Kyrie, a player they just gave up a lot of their assets for at the deadline, could just walk. In fact, there's countless of reports surrounding that topic, most commonly involving the Lakers clearing up the space to just sign him outright. The only players the Mavericks have on contract for the following season is Luca Hardaway Jr., Maxi Kleber, Josh Green, Jaden Hardy, and JaVale McGee. So eventually, the inevitable decision was made. They're going to do everything in their power to lose the final two games. Something that shouldn't be too hard. The Bulls won't even have their first round pick unless they jump into the top four, and the Spurs already have their lottery position locked in. They shut down Kyrie. They actually start Luka Doncic, but even before the game started, it was reported he was only going to play the first quarter. The team's minute leaders is Theo Pinson, Frank Nilakina, Reggie Bullock, Justin Holliday, and McKinley Wright. Their intention for this game is pretty clear. But things didn't go as smoothly as they hoped. A Jaden Hardy half-court buzzer beater to close the first half has the Mavericks up 13. This is not good, and unwilling to take any chances, the entirety of the fourth quarter sees a lineup of Theo Pinson, McKinley Wright, AJ Lawson, Justin Holliday, and Reggie Bullock. But while the Bulls were likely to not have their first round selection, they already had their playing position locked in, meaning they were actually incentivized to lose this game as well, giving them a slightly better chance at jumping into the top four and hopefully keeping their selection. So the fourth quarter also saw a lineup from them of Patrick Williams, Kobe White, Ayo Desunmu, Karlik Jones, and Terry Taylor. This is really one of the most unique and weird situations we've seen at the end of the regular season. I want to say intense, but that just doesn't feel right. Finally, we see the Mavericks get on track. With 2 minutes and 25 seconds left, they find themselves down 5 points. But an AJ Lawson 3 brings that down to 2. They trade buckets, it's a 3 point game, 
with one minute and 10 seconds left on the clock. A McKinley right lay-in brings that to just a one point deficit. The Bulls come down and bring that back up to three. No shot clock, Theo Pinson heaves one up. As crazy as it may seem, the implications of this shot will greatly shape the future of both the Mavericks and Luka Doncic. But luckily the call was made from upstairs. Pinson was trying not to make it look too obvious, but we know his intentions. Dallas narrowly avoids disaster. Mark Cuban can't hold back a smile on the sideline. They did it. Oh, but wait. Derek Jones misses both free throws on the other end. You can't make this up. Not like this. A block three, an inbound with nine seconds. An AJ Lawson throw up, a miss, but an offensive board from the corner, not even a chance. They did it. And in the final game of the season against the Spurs, they learned from their mistakes in that game. And they were putting Pinson and Frank Nilakina out there for 40 minutes each as they got smacked around. It's official. They're going to hold the 10th spot in the lottery. Sure, jumping into the top four would be nice. Number one would completely alter the franchise. But to crack the top four, they had just a 14% chance. They were fully content with just staying at 10 as dropping down just a singular spot sees them send their pick to New York. Now, what were the odds of that happening? The Bulls sat with a 9.4% chance to jump. The Thunder 7.1, Raptors 4.8, and Pelicans 2.4. That comes out to an average of 5.9 per team, which would be a 94.1% chance at a positive outcome for the Mavericks per selection. Seems comfortable, but collectively, that comes out to a 22% chance at least one of these teams jumps up. Still fairly comfortable, but far from guaranteed. We go to the lottery and things are going quick. The Pelicans are at 14. The Raptors are at 13. They're on track. They're up to an 84% chance of pulling this off. The Thunder are at 12. They've only got to fade a 9.4% chance from the Bulls. And they do it. They can take a breath. For a brief moment, they can dream of jumping into the top four. That doesn't happen, but it's fine. They've got the 10th overall pick. Now, because they kept this pick, they will be giving their 2024 first. But not only does next year's draft project to be a much weaker one, the Mavericks also don't project even before free agency to have a pick this high. Now that that's out the way, they can finally focus on building out this roster, and there's a very clear priority at the top. Obviously retaining Kyrie, but aside from that, it's defense. Something that's always going to be the concern with a Luka Kyrie-led team. But these two also raise the floor so high offensively that a middle of the pack defensive unit might allow this team to be a serious threat in the Western Conference. Going into the draft, it felt like attacking defense was going to be the priority, but not necessarily a given. With such little assets going forward, they had to prioritize value over anything. As we got closer and closer to the pick, we were starting to really only hear three names brought up. If Taylor Hendricks somehow made it past the Jazz at nine, that felt like a lot, but assuming that didn't happen, it was gonna be one of Keeson Wallace, Derek Lively, some of the best defenders in this class, but still two completely different directions with them on other ends of the lineup, or Kansas sharpshooter Grady Dick. The picks start to go by, and once we reach the Mavericks, they actually have their choice of any of those three mentioned players, and also somehow Cam Whitmore, someone most expected to not even make it past the top five. But the Mavericks didn't decide to select any of these players, at least not yet. They decided to trade down from the 12th overall pick to the 10th pick with the Oklahoma City Thunder. To do so, they didn't acquire draft capital. They unloaded the contract of Davis Bertans, who was getting paid $17 million this season and $16 million next. This wasn't going to directly create cap space for Dallas, but created a traded player exception, allowing them to make a trade that brings in up to $17 million in salary without having to match the contracts. This was for dropping down just two spots to 12 where they would select Derek Lively II from Duke University. Someone they likely still would have taken had they stayed at 10. Just a year ago, he was coming out of high school as the number one recruit in the country. He's a seven foot one center with a ridiculous seven foot eight wingspan and the lateral speed that gives him the upside to potentially be one of the best defenders in the league one day. The offense is extremely limited right now, but after shooting like this the entire pre-draft process, those limitations feel far from permanent. But after this selection, their night wasn't even over yet. We wouldn't have to wait too long for them to use that trade exception. Leading up to the Kings being on the clock at 24, a lot of buzz surrounded them potentially selecting Chris Murray, the twin brother of their fourth overall pick from the year prior, Keegan Murray. As the picks went by, it seemed like it was going to happen. Only one pick was left, the Portland Trailblazers. Chris Murray from the University of Iowa. 
We don't know for sure whether Chris Murray was the guy at 24, but with them deciding to make a move while on the clock, this is the Mavericks picking now at 24. It definitely seems that way. They pivoted, deciding to do a similar deal to what the Mavericks did 14 selections earlier. They sent Dallas their 24th overall pick to take on the contract of Rashawn Holmes. The Kings would receive nothing in return. It was a move purely made to free up cap space. And with that selection, the Dallas Mavericks select Olivier Maxon Prosper. The Sacramento Kings is the hat that he's putting on, but this pick is on its way to Dallas. The six foot eight, seven foot one wingspan forward, defensive juggernaut out of Marquette. Really think about what just happened. Just a few months ago, they made the decision to go for draft position with only a couple games left in the year. They squeak out the 10th spot in the lottery, avoid a team jumping up from behind, but then take that singular 10th overall pick in the draft and turn it into the 12th pick Derek Lively, the 24th pick Omax Prosper, and also swap Bertans for Rashawn Holmes, someone that actually has a wide range of outcomes for this team. We're only a couple years removed from him showing a ton of potential, especially defensively, hence why he's on the contract he is. But it's been a rough couple seasons. This past year, he was struggling to even get on the court for Sacramento. But the chance he brings this team productive minutes in the rotation is significantly higher than it ever was for Bertans. An incredible start to the offseason. But the key word there is start. They were still looking down at that very underwhelming list of players on contract, but now just minus Bertans and adding in Rashawn Holmes and two rookies. And a tier of its own in terms of priority was bringing back Kyrie. Regardless of whether or not the fit alongside Luka is good or he's the best option long term, they just couldn't afford to see the value of Kyrie walk. That would be disastrous. And luckily, no one was really able to compete with the money the Mavericks could offer, so they didn't have to wait long. They re-signed him to a three-year, $120 million deal with $6 million in additional incentives and a player option in the final year. A contract that balances risk and reward pretty well for the 31-year-old. Now, not everyone feels that way. Dallas had to go to 3 for 126 for Kyrie because there were at least three other teams ready to offer 2 for 25. Likely hyperbole, but this definitely is a lot of money to pay given all the unknown and uncertainty that comes with Kyrie on your roster. But Dallas was left with no other option. This is also another clear example of how everything really went the Mavericks way over the last couple months. To close out the season, we saw reports over and over and over again about the Lakers going after Kyrie in the offseason. If the season ended in the middle of February, they would have most likely done that. But the Lakers trade deadline ended up being everything the Mavericks hoped their trade deadline would be. They went on a tear to close the year in large part due to their recent additions, D'Lo, Vanderbilt, Rui, and the breakout of Austin Reeves. In order to actually target Kyrie without the Mavericks facilitating a sign and trade, they would have to renounce the free agent rights of D'Angelo Russell and Rui while also waiving Vanderbilt and needing a miracle to still bring back Austin Reeves. It would be similar to the Suns approach, Kyrie, LeBron, and AD with Bol Bol and Wantanabe. After going all the way to the Western Conference Finals, that made close to no sense whatsoever. So the Mavericks were really facing close to no competition in bringing back Kyrie unless he was willing to take some crazy pay cut. But after that deal came through, it looked like the Mavericks didn't have much room for improvement. It was starting to look like a situation where it was going to be basically the same team as last year, just with some additional rookies that you were just hoping would be major impact contributors from day one. But then things got interesting. They would bring in Seth Curry, someone it never hurts to have in the rotation. It was only three years ago, he was playing a significant role with them, having the top offense in the league. They brought back Dwight Powell, which is a positive, but again, not a needle mover. These were both solid moves, there's no doubt about that, but again, Offense isn't really the concern with this team. These moves didn't shift the outlook at all. But someone that might is Grant Williams, who they would sign to a four-year, $53 million contract via a sign-in trade. The Celtics got four second-round picks. The San Antonio Spurs got Reggie Bullock, a second-rounder, and a first-round pick swap in 2030. And the Mavericks landed Grant Williams with two additional second-rounders. Giving up an unprotected swap that far in the future is extremely dangerous. But the Mavericks have to take that risk. This is someone that was just in and out of the rotation during the Celtics playoff run, but he's also shown flashes of someone that could be a game changer for a team like Dallas. His defense is inconsistent, but the strength he possesses at 6'6 is a rare combination that puts him in an elite tier of versatility that's created scenarios such as him being the Celtics best option guarding players like Giannis Antetokounmpo and rather successfully during playoff stretches. He also brings an energy to the court that most of the time is extremely corny, but sometimes extremely positive to the group as a whole. Offensively, he's never had much responsibility put on his shoulders, but over the last couple years, he's been pretty efficient at low volume. He's coming off a season averaging 8 points, shooting 40% from 3. He's also just 24 years old, meaning the player that we've come to know might not necessarily be the player the Mavericks are gonna have going forward. 
Now moves like this always interest me. The incentives for Dallas to give up those assets goes further than just Grant Williams. Making this addition via a sign and trade allowed them to retain their mid-level exception. But they also made another small addition that didn't get much attention as we haven't seen him in the league for a few years, but was once a top pick in the draft, Dante Exum. Another player that thrived defensively in the league, but the offensive limitations eventually saw him going overseas. But he's actually coming off a great season in Europe. He shot 47% from three in 23 games in the Turkish league, 42% from three in his 33 Euro league games. That comes out to 44% from three on the season. This is truly brilliant work from Nico Harrison in this front office. Attacking a specific goal for a roster is a recipe for success, and they did that without sacrificing shooting. Take the Nuggets, for example. They decided to go away from Monte Morris, Will Barton, eventually Bones Highland, all solid on ball creators and just offensive players in general, in favor of players that could play multiple positions and make an impact on both ends of the floor. Bruce Brown in free agency, Christian Brown in the draft, KCP via a trade. There's definitely some very interesting parallels here between what the Nuggets did a year ago and the Mavericks this season. I've got a feeling there was probably some inspiration. Now, the floor on this Dallas team offensively is extremely high. Since 2019, the Mavericks have been one of the top offenses year in and year out. After getting Kyrie, there was no signs of that being a different story. So they attack the offseason as if the offense is a given. You lose some liabilities on the other end, Bertans and Christian Wood, and you pick up Williams, Exum, Holmes, Lively, Prosper. Some of these players have had their ups and downs defensively, but collectively bring a ton on the defensive end. As we mentioned, most of them also are coming off seasons where they proved capable of at least being decent spot up shooters. This rotation is really going to be one that's fascinating to pay attention to. As of right now, it projects to be something like Kyrie, Luka, Hardaway, Williams, Powell, and Prosper, Curry, Kleber, Lively off the bench. But they're in a situation where they have a ton of options, something that was far from the case a year ago when they were having to have Hardaway Jr. and Reggie Bullock as their starting forwards down the stretch. Now that rotation right there is not even including Exum, Hardy, Green, Rashawn Holmes, all guys that could end up proving worthy of significant roles. Even the minutes within that nine-man group are subject to a ton of change. Maybe Lively is the real deal from day one and becomes a starter, opening the door to have the option to go bigger or smaller with Powell either at the four or coming off the bench. This is a team that was in the Western Conference Finals on the back of Luka Doncic, Jalen Brunson, and Spencer Dinwiddie a year ago. It's so interesting to see just how many people have written them off. This is a team that's going to be a top offensive group led by two players that have proven themselves as elite playoff performers that just added a plethora of defensive talent across the entire lineup. They also added something to this roster they haven't had in a long time, and especially after Brunson walked, and that's actual player assets. Between Lively, Prosper, Hardy, Green, and some draft capital still in their pocket, they can actually make some moves before the deadline, something that would have been a lot tougher if they failed to lose just one of those seemingly irrelevant to most regular season games. Now it is hard to envision them competing with the top teams in the Western Conference, but you can't write them off. Take a look at their Vegas odds. I think they're positioned pretty appropriately, sandwiched right between the Clippers and Grizzlies in terms of title chances. Given the situation this front office was handed and the potential disaster they avoided, while the latter obviously included some luck, this was an off-season masterclass.